and joyful cheering greeted prince and princess. The world gets its first full glimpse of the fairy tale princess. She will leave as a princess. We love royal weddings because their fairy tales come to life. There's a fascination with royal weddings because they are just so extravagant. And now the great hour arrives. Let's sit into the crowd as she arrives at the Abbey. We finally get to see that dress. You see the princess in the, in the big gown and her prince often in like a military uniform. And it's just romantic and, and everything you fantasize about as a little girl. For anyone who grew up reading fairy tales or loving princesses and princes and carriages and palaces, there is no question that a royal wedding is the pinnacle of all of that fantasy. That really is the most extraordinary fairy tale. happily share the supreme day of their lives with their countrymen. Princess Elizabeth and Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, were married in 1947, just two years after the end of World War II. When Princess Elizabeth and Philip got married, coming out of World War II, which was a time of such hardship, the whole country, really the whole world, was looking for a reason to celebrate, so it really kind of brought everyone together. Elizabeth was 21 years old and next in line to the throne. Philip was a dashing 26-year-old Navy lieutenant with ties to the Greek and Danish royal families. Elizabeth and Philip have a really sweet love story. Uh, they first met when Elizabeth was just 13 years old and she was immediately smitten by Philip. He was this dashing naval officer. It was very easy to see why Princess Elizabeth was so taken with him. During the war, Philip went off to serve. The Queen kept in contact with Philip and Philip would write letters to the Queen during this time the connection was really cemented. Then after the war, Philip came back and they started spending time together at Buckingham Palace and soon after, Philip proposed. And the Queen, in quite uh, unusual manner of the time, said yes without checking with her father, without checking with royal officials. And this kind of really typifies the strength of character that the Queen has. But at her father's urging, she and Philip agreed to keep their engagement a secret for a full year until she turned 21. So it really was a sweet, romantic story, and they were very much in love. On November 20th, 1947, a year and a half after the couple's secret engagement, Elizabeth and Philip were wed at historic Westminster Abbey. And now the great hour arrives, and as the state coach with Elizabeth and the King is escorted to Westminster Abbey by the household of cavalry guards, a sovereign's escort. Everyone was really excited for this wedding, and the footage is really incredible. To see a half a million people lining the streets of London to watch Princess Elizabeth and her father, King George VI, ride in a royal carriage from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Abbey. The coach draws up at the west door, and His Majesty pauses to help the Princess alight. There's a moment's delay, due, I imagine, to the 15-foot train of the Princess's most beautiful wedding gown. Then, with her father, the royal bride enters for her marriage to the man of her choice. Of course, this was a huge event, and there were 2,500 invited guests inside Westminster Abbey. And of those guests, 28 were members of European royalty, including six kings and seven queens. So this was a really impressive turnout for such a historic occasion. Here is seen the thrilling bridal gown of ivory satin, delicately embroidered in crystals and pearls. Princess Elizabeth's dress was absolutely beautiful. Um, it was a long-sleeved, you know, ivory silk creation. It had 10,000 pearls sewn onto it and had a 15-foot train. It was actually inspired by a Botticelli painting called Primavera. And the central figure in the painting wears this beautiful white draped ivory gown. And it also had these like roses affixed to it. And it really did look like the gown from the paintings. It is a radiant bride-to-be, the loveliest the old abbey has ever looked upon. Elizabeth and Philip take their places on history's pages. To the stirring strains of Mendelssohn, they march as man and wife toward the west door amidst nearly 3,000 invited spectators. At this time, this was really the most access the British public had ever had to a royal wedding because it was the first to be broadcast over radio and it really brought the British public into Westminster Abbey even if they couldn't be there in person or even on the streets of London. 
From the solemnity of the Abbey, the great pageant starts toward Buckingham Palace, the young couple now occupying the state coach. And it was also the second wedding to be filmed, and though it wasn't broadcast live on television, since television wasn't really ubiquitous yet, um, but it was shown on newsreels later, so people really got to feel like they were there and feel like they were part of this celebration. They proceed with a brilliantly uniformed mounted guards through throngs estimated at two millions. In post-war England, everything is rationed except cheers, and the enthusiasm mounts to a new high. Thousands jam the square before Buckingham Palace, and the cry goes up, we want Elizabeth. There um, is a tradition of after a royal wedding that the royal family gather on the balcony of Buckingham Palace and meet the nation. And when this happened with um, Princess Elizabeth and Prince Philip, the crowds went wild. There was such a huge cheer and it was a really great time of celebration. Three generations of the royal family now appear, but it is the young bride and groom who really rule England this day. Princess Elizabeth and Prince Philip's love story really meant a lot to the British people. And it was something that, you know, wasn't about war, it wasn't about politics, this was just a young couple in love. And that was something to celebrate that had no, you know, no ties to something that made them unhappy. Elizabeth and Philip's wedding was the beginning of an incredible 70-year marriage, the longest in British royal history by two decades. The first five years after their wedding were arguably the best of their lives. They lived a pretty quiet life, relatively speaking. Philip was in the Navy, and they spent time in Malta during his naval service, and they also welcomed two children, Prince Charles and Princess Anne. But then her father died in 1952 and made Elizabeth the Queen, something they weren't expecting to happen for several years to come. So suddenly they were forced to adapt and take on this whole new life full of royal duties and assume the position of being the face of a nation. Prince Philip has been by her side through it all. They really have this epic love story, you know, married for seven years, they have four children, eight grandchildren, you know, they've had this, this really big family that's, you know, full of love and everyone's so close and, you know, it's a really sweet testament to their bond. In the proud words of King George, our daughter has married the man she loves. Everyone here in the grounds of the palace must have been captivated by Grace's charm and beauty. Long before Charles and Diana, this was the fairy tale. Tiny Monaco took on Hollywood overtones when film queen Grace Kelly was tumultuously greeted as she arrived for her marriage to Prince Rainier. In 1956, Prince Rainier III of Monaco married American actress Grace Kelly. The extraordinary two-day event was immediately dubbed the wedding of the century. Though this isn't a British royal wedding, it is definitely one of the most famous royal weddings of all time. Long before Charles and Diana, this was the fairy tale. She was an American movie star, she met a prince in Europe, and they fell madly in love and got married. Rainier was the 33-year-old reigning monarch of Monaco, while Grace was well on her way to becoming Hollywood royalty. The glamorous and talented 26-year-old had already earned two Oscar nominations, including a Best Actress win for The Country Girl. I don't know where to begin to apologize, Mrs. Elgin. You can begin by not calling me Mrs. Elgin. But she will always be best remembered for her three films with director Alfred Hitchcock. Dial M for Murder, Rear Window, and To Catch a Thief. You're here in Europe to buy a husband. The man I want doesn't have a price. To Catch a Thief is such an iconic film. Grace Kelly is beautiful and glamorous, co-starring opposite Cary Grant. And it was shot on location in Cannes, France, which coincidentally is where Grace would later meet Prince Rainier. Grace Kelly and Prince Rainier first met, fittingly, when she was in Cannes in France for the Cannes Film Festival. And they ended up being set up by Olivia de Havilland, another, you know, iconic actress, and her husband, who was a French newspaper editor who knew Rainier. Um, so they sort of coordinated this meeting between Rainier and Grace Kelly. They hit it off immediately. They kept in correspondence when she came back to the United States. He came to America to meet her and her family. Grace Kelly's from right outside Philadelphia. She had Prince Rainier over for dinner. Even though he had this royal title and this very fancy background, he would help out with the dishes at her, at her childhood home. And you know, it really endeared him to her family. And soon after they were engaged. 
Grace Kelly and Prince Rainier's romance really was a whirlwind. They met in April of 1955, became engaged in January of 1956, and the wedding was set for that April. So from meeting to marriage, it was really only around 12 months. A few hours earlier, Grace Kelly of Philadelphia and Hollywood stepped aboard the Deo Giovanni from the liner Constitution, which carried her across the Atlantic. To get to Monaco for her wedding, Grace Kelly, um, you know, she didn't fly. She took a yacht with a huge entourage of about 700 people. And when she did arrive, she had 80 suitcases with her and her poodle, Oliver. Um, and Prince Rainier was there waiting for her. Um, and so were 1,800 photographers and reporters. And it was really kind of this just epic, almost over the top arrival, but, you know, really spoke to the significance of the transition she was making from Hollywood film star to real life princess. This was the glittering scene at Monte Carlo on the night before the civil wedding took place. The party really started at the palace the night before the wedding. Grace Kelly and Prince Rainier watched from the balcony as down below there were performances by French folk dancers and the London Festival Ballet. And of course there were fireworks. The entire city really rallied around this couple and took part in the celebrations. Local law called for two separate events. The first, on April 18, was a civil ceremony held in the palace throne room, which was followed by a garden party with 3,000 invited guests. Everyone here in the grounds of the palace must have been captivated by Grace's charm and beauty. The religious wedding took place the next day at St. Nicholas Cathedral. The ceremony was broadcast live on television and 30 million viewers tuned in. Solemnly, on her father's arm, she enters the cathedral. All eyes are on her, an entrancing picture in her magnificent gown, and she takes her place before the high altar. Grace Kelly's wedding dress, still today, is without a doubt one of the most iconic royal wedding dresses of all time. It was this beautiful lace, high-necked, long-sleeved gown with a big skirt. The wedding dress was actually a gift from MGM Studios, where Grace Kelly had made some of her movies. It was made by one of the costume designers at the studio, Helen Rose. Today, it would be considered to be worth about $70,000. This wedding will go down in history as one of the most elegant, solely because of Grace Kelly's dress. This dress was so stylish and so beautiful. The wedding at which the Bishop of Monaco officiated is marked by the dignified solemnity befitting such a ceremony. Now, by civil authority and by the church, Prince Rainier and his film star bride have been pronounced man and wife. The wedding procession moves slowly from the cathedral. This, of course, was the moment for which the monogasques outside had been waiting, and joyful cheering greeted prince and princess. After they left the church, there were thousands of people waiting outside and lining the streets just hoping to catch a glimpse of the new prince and princess. I think that people really responded to them as a couple because they seemed so much in love. From the first time they met till after their children were young adults, they really seemed like the kind of fairy tale that you wanted them to be. Our story ends with the scene at the harbor, as the princess, carrying her poodle Oliver, arrives with her husband to board their yacht, in which they were leaving for their honeymoon. And it goes without saying that as the royal couple left, all good wishes went with them for long life and happiness. After Grace Kelly's marriage to Prince Rainier, where she became Princess Grace, she did give up her film career. Um, you know, she was only 26 years old at the time, and even though she had won an Oscar, it still was pretty early on. So it really was a big loss for Hollywood. And instead, she focused on being a wife and soon a mother, and you know, her duties as the Princess Consort of Monaco. Um, you know, though she had to give up her acting career, being a princess in a beautiful country on the Mediterranean isn't such a bad trade. The loyal subjects shouted gleefully, long live the prince and his beautiful princess. In 1960, Princess Margaret married the commoner, Anthony Armstrong Jones. The historic event was the first royal wedding ever to be broadcast live on television. I'm Margaret Rose. Take the Anthony Charles Robert to my wedded husband. Anthony was a 30-year-old society photographer with no royal blood. Margaret was the 29-year-old younger sister of Queen Elizabeth. 
the story of Princess Margaret is really complicated. She had actually fallen in love with a different man. Princess Margaret's first love was a man named Peter Townsend. He was a bit older than her, and he was a military hero during World War II. They fell in love when she was in her late teens, early 20s, um, but he was a divorcee. And at the time, that was a huge no-no in the royal family because of the views of the Church of England on divorce. And so for Margaret, that meant she wasn't able to marry the man she considered the love of her life. And it really broke her heart. Princess Margaret, as she got older, became a very, you know, cosmopolitan, almost like kind of a new royal. And she ran in very cool circles, you know, with more artists or celebrities. And that led her to meeting Anthony Armstrong Jones, who was a very famous photographer who had actually shot portraits of the royal family. Anthony Armstrong Jones was an easy sell to the rest of the palace because they knew him. Um, he had taken a lot of the royal portraits, so he was someone that they thought was appropriate for Margaret. Their relationship kind of flew under the radar, and when they announced that they were engaged, it really surprised the press, it surprised the public, and it really was an unconventional choice for Margaret. He was the first commoner to marry into the royal family in 400 years, which is kind of baffling when you think about it now, when you think of people like Kate Middleton and Meghan Markle marrying into the royal family, both of whom are commoners. For Margaret, after being denied the chance to marry her first love, this really looked like a second chance at love. Through cheering crowds of hundreds of thousands, Princess Margaret rides to Westminster Abbey on her wedding day. On May 6, 1960, Princess Margaret and Anthony Armstrong Jones married in Westminster Abbey, the grandest setting you can imagine. The Queen and members of the royal family have taken their places, and Commonwealth Prime Ministers, the bridegroom, and what a moment for him as his bride enters. Because Princess Margaret's father, you know, passed away almost 10 years before that, Prince Philip, her brother-in-law, actually walked her down the aisle, which was sort of a sweet show of familial support. There were 2,000 guests, and what really made it historic was that it was the first televised wedding in British history. The service is begun by the Dean of Westminster. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here in the sight of God and in the face in the of the In the UK alone, 20 million viewers tuned in. Together while 300 million more were watching from all over the world. Now every detail and nuance of the ceremony is under the scrutiny of countless millions, but the dignity and grandeur of the rites are not marred. I pronounce that they be men and wife together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Princess Margaret's royal wedding dress was relatively simple compared to past royal wedding dresses. Life magazine described Margaret's dress as, quote, the simplest wedding gown in history, although it did feature 30 meters of fabric just for the full skirt. It had long sleeves and a very thick silk. It was a V-neck that came very high up on her neck. And then it had a really wide skirt, but there really wasn't any lace or any you know, gems or pearls or crystals. So it was very simple, but it definitely still was an iconic dress, but just a little different from what we've come to expect from royal weddings. The traditional appearance on the palace balcony is what the people want to see. Raising a great cheer again for the princess and her husband. Although Margaret's wedding was a gorgeous spectacle and gave hope that she was going to have the fairy tale ending that she always dreamed of, the truth is it wasn't a happily ever after. Still wearing some of the parting rose petals, they went out by barge to Britannia, the start of a wonderful honeymoon cruise to the Caribbean things started to crumble for Margaret and Tony fairly early on, although they did have two children, David Viscount Lindley and Lady Sarah, before they drifted apart. Things were happy throughout the 60s, but by the 70s, fractures were starting to show. They didn't spend as much time together. Um, there was infidelity rumored on both sides. Um, we would later learn that for Tony, the infidelity went back, you know, all the way to when they first got married, which was very controversial when it came out, but it didn't come out for years to come. Eventually, they announced their divorce in 1978, and it was the first divorce by a senior member of the royal family since Henry VIII. The irony is that with her first love, Peter Townsend, everyone in the royal family and the public had been so concerned Margaret was going to marry someone who had been divorced. 
And then Margaret herself ended up becoming the first member, senior member of the royal family to divorce in 400 years. Later in life, Princess Margaret was actually famous for, you know, lo rumored love affairs, and she was kind of known as like this very cosmopolitan, but sort of scandalous figure. Margaret never remarried. She wound up having a series of health problems that ultimately led to her death in 2002. In 2004, um, a woman named Polly Fry came forward and she claimed that she was the daughter of Tony, Lord Snowden. And Polly took a paternity test and it turned out that Tony was her father. Granted, this all came out in 2004 and Margaret had passed away in 2002, so it remains to be seen whether she ever knew about this, you know, in her private life. Waving goodbye to London, while we wish them every happiness, every blessing, and a long life together. And so Lady Diana in that truly stunning dress is well and truly launched on her way to the cathedral. Diana's dress probably went down as the most, one of the most famous dresses in history. With that dress shimmering like a mirage as it rippled down the red carpet behind her. any heart that hasn't been won over by her today, it can kindly surrender now. When Prince Charles married Lady Diana Spencer in 1981, it was widely seen as the ultimate fairy tale wedding. But sadly, looks were deceiving. The irony of this royal wedding is that the person Charles had been having an affair with, Camilla Parker Bowles, attended the wedding and Diana actually um, noticed her as she walked down the aisle. Diana was the 20-year-old daughter of British nobility. Charles was the 32-year-old heir apparent to the throne. It's funny to think about now, but Prince Charles really was the world's most eligible bachelor back then. Diana was born Lady Diana Spencer, so she was an aristocrat. She was young, she was a member of the Church of England and had a title. She was a virgin, which was a big thing that mattered when it came to marrying an heir to the throne back then. So, you know, it was just sort of like, she's perfect. Charles was facing a lot of pressure to find someone. So um, they kind of were engaged very quickly and it seemed like this whirlwind romance. <laughs> I think we all wanted it to be this romantic fairy tale, um, but when you look back, there were certainly clues that it wasn't going to end well. There was a large age difference between Princess Diana and Prince Charles, and really, they just had totally different interests. Another huge obstacle was Camilla Parker Bowles. Camilla had been Charles's first really serious love, and they had ended things, and she had gone on to get married to someone else. Well, by the time Charles met Diana, he and Camilla had reconnected, and Charles found it very difficult to turn off his feelings for her. Charles and Diana gave a very memorable pre-wedding interview where the interviewer asked them if they were in love. I, I, I'm amazed that she's uh, been brave enough to take me on. <laughs> and I suppose in love. Of course. Diana said immediately, yes, of course. And then Charles just sort of looked off to the side and said, whatever in love means. So. <laughs> whatever in love means. And it was in that moment that the veil was sort of lifted. Well, it obviously, you put your means, own interpretation. Uh, obviously means two very happy people. Yes. Once again, congratulations. congratulations. Well, from us, congratulations. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Be kind. So the cracks were starting to show even as they were engaged. but. You know, the world kind of didn't really notice and was very taken by what they saw was a fairy tale romance. As if by royal appointment, the weather on the great day is perfect, giving London a touch of summer magic. The wedding day, July 29, 1981, was declared a national holiday so everyone in the UK could join the celebration. The ceremony was broadcast live in 74 countries and a staggering 750 million viewers tuned in. Everyone who was around then will tell their stories of waking up early, wherever they were, whatever time zone, you know, watching in their pajamas. It became a, a massive sensation, even for people who didn't normally follow the royals. And then the bridegroom, the Prince of Wales, arrived. As Prince Charles was the heir to the throne, his wedding was a full-on state occasion. Um, it wasn't held at Westminster Abbey because there were too many guests. So they had another very famous London church, St. Paul's Cathedral. It was attended by 3,500 guests, which included dignitaries and world leaders, including Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and U.S. First Lady um, Nancy Reagan. 
In their book today, the bride was the star of the show. What really sets the wedding of Prince Charles and Princess Diana apart is Diana's worldwide appeal and charisma. She had already really become a superstar by the time she married Charles. And so Lady Diana in that truly stunning dress is well and truly launched on her way to the cathedral. The speculation about what Princess Diana would wear on her wedding day was huge. Everybody wanted to know. Um, it was actually so much so that the designers actually had a second dress prepared just in case the first one leaked. Um, but it didn't. And she rode in the glass coach, almost all nerves forgotten now, with her father, to marry the man she loved. When you watch the footage of Diana in the carriage, it's a little bit funny because you can see that she's sort of drowning in all these yards of taffeta, and she almost looks like, you know, a giant cupcake stuffed into this little glass box. Lord Spencer alighted first, and then came, always a tricky moment for any bride, and Lady Diana had a train worthy of the biggest cathedral in the world, and worthy of the great church of St. Paul. Diana's dress probably went down as the mo one of the most famous dresses in history. The world gets its first full glimpse of the fairy tale princess, demure behind her veil. It was just so voluminous and so 80s and so princessy. And the wedding dress that has been a carefully guarded secret, resplendent ivory silk taffeta trimmed with antique lace and a long, long train, all 25 feet hand embroidered. It was just yards and yards of ivory taffeta. And in fact, designer Elizabeth Emanuel, who co-designed the dress alongside her then-husband David, later said that her vision for the dress was that Diana was a butterfly coming out of the chrysalis. As bewitching and romantic a bride as ever touched the heart of the world. But that long train is a bridesmaid's nightmare. Elizabeth Emanuel also later said that she hadn't anticipated the dress wrinkling quite so much as it did. So they quickly tried to smooth that long train because it was just wrinkled from top to bottom. And everyone could see that this was a bride who had captured all but the stoniest of hearts. When it was time to walk down the aisle, the whole world was already mesmerized and couldn't wait to see this superstar become a superstar bride. Diana Francis. Wilt thou have this man to thy wedded husband, to live together according to God's law in the holy estate of matrimony, so long as ye both shall live? I will. Charles and Diana's wedding was such a massive spectacle that it came with a very massive price tag. Adjusted for inflation, it cost $110 million, which is a lot steeper than the wedding of William and Kate, which was a relatively frugal $34 million. <laughs> and the roar welling in thousands of throats outside. It all lent another kind of warmth to this London summer's day, with that dress shimmering like a mirage as it rippled down the red carpet behind her. Despite the concerns surrounding this marriage that were sort of present even from the beginning, there was a really, truly romantic sweeping moment atop the balcony at Buckingham Palace after they had exchanged their vows. And this is what they're waiting for, an appearance on the balcony of Buckingham Palace, which has seen so many royal and national occasions in the past. Again, everyone who watched the wedding remembers their kiss. He kisses Diana's hand. They look at each other um, with an adoring gaze that you would expect from newlyweds. A kiss which receives a roar of approval from the crowd, who call the couple back and back again onto the balcony. It's hard to argue with half a million people who know what they want. And every single one was rewarded by this tender kiss. They seemed to be a happy couple in those early years. Um, right away, they had two adorable sons, William and Harry, and they seemed good together. But we found out later it really wasn't all that it seemed. Well, there were three of us in this marriage. So it was a bit crowded. <laughs> Charles was still hung up on Camilla and eventually started to have an affair with her. Um, Diana sort of followed suit and she also had several affairs um, and things really just were very tense between them. In 1992, 11 years after their wedding, Charles and Diana separated and by 1996, their divorce was final. Charles seemed to move on and, and he found his happily ever after with Camilla. 
But Diana was searching for what she was going to do next, and, and then it all kind of came to a terrible, tragic end in Paris. Confirmation from Buckingham Palace tonight that the world has lost uh, Princess Diana at age 36, uh, dead in a car crash in Paris. Looking back on Charles and Diana's wedding, it's really bittersweet because on the one hand, it's the most magical day anyone could have imagined and it still captivates the public imagination. And on the other hand, we all know that it ended in heartbreak and tragedy. But one of the biggest gifts from Charles and Diana's wedding was this next generation of royals who really energized royal fans around the world to follow their lives, their loves, the charities that they've supported through the years. Um, and we see that in all of the admiration and affection for Prince William, for Prince Harry, for William and Kate's children, and it keeps going. A new princess for Wales, and the shyness seemed gone replaced by a genuine wonderment that so many people should want to share her joy. Absolute chaos. I'm being swept forward with the crowd. I can, in fact, I don't think I could get away from them if I wanted to. In 1986, just five years after Charles and Diana were married, the wedding of Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson proved the British people were still hungry for royal nuptials. Because Andrew was not the direct heir, it may have seemed like the wedding wouldn't have been quite the massive affair that Charles and Diana's wedding was, but there was a huge appetite for it, and people really wanted another royal wedding. Andrew was the 26-year-old son of Queen Elizabeth, and fourth in line to the throne. Sarah was the 26-year-old daughter of a retired major in the British Army. Sarah Ferguson was the daughter of a very influential uh, military veteran, and he definitely had elite connections, but she was untitled, she was a commoner, um, she wasn't a member of the royal family or the aristocracy. Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson had actually known each other and overlapped in similar circles since childhood. They were reacquainted in 1985 at Royal Ascot when actually Princess Diana played matchmaker and reintroduced them. This really was a love story. Andrew really did adore Sarah, and so did the British public to begin with. Her name was Sarah Ferguson, but you know, very quickly on, the public dubbed her Fergie, and that's a nickname that's really lasted until today. It was easy to see why the public was excited about Fergie. She was young, she was fun, she had that fiery red hair. She didn't always have everything quite smoothed out, and I think initially that endeared her to a lot of people. The excitement mounted as the bridegroom appeared through the gates of Buckingham Palace, complete with his new titles and his best man, Prince Edward. Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson married on July 23rd, 1986 at Westminster Abbey and the wedding was attended by 2,000 guests. A half a billion people watched it on television and another 100,000 lined the streets outside the palace. But it was the bride and her dress that everyone was waiting to see. Ivory silk duchess satin embroidered with honeybees and thistles, emblems from her coat of arms. Fergie's dress was quintessentially 80s. It has these big puffy sleeves, almost looks like she's wearing shoulder pads. Um, she also wore this extensive taffeta train, huge full skirt. The bodice was heavily beaded, and then in silver beads embroidered on the train were Sarah and Andrew's initials. A few last minute adjustments, and the ceremony passed off with scarcely a hitch. I, Sarah Margaret. I, Sarah Margaret. Take the Andrew Albert Christian Edward. Take the Andrew Albert Christian, Christian Edward. To my wedded husband. To my wedded husband. In the footage of the wedding, you can really see Princess Diana smiling and looking very happy. And, you know, clearly she was pleased that this relationship that she had sort of, you know, sowed the seeds for um, ended up blossoming in, into something that turned into marriage. With a quick look back and a thank you, the couple stepped out into the sunlight and the cheers from the crowd. The Duchess demonstrated her own energetic version of the royal wave on the way back to the palace. 
One of the sweetest and most spontaneous moments in Andrew and Fergie's wedding is when you see a young Prince William run up to his uncle Andrew and give him a hug. It's just so fun to watch. People lined the streets and waited outside Buckingham Palace for them to come out on the balcony. Um, and everybody really wanted to see them kiss. And so they were yelling, kiss, kiss. And Prince Andrew even kind of toyed with the crowd and he goes, you know, what, what? The crowd asked for it and the crowd got it. They did share a kiss um, for all the people on the balcony, which was such a sweet moment. The kiss, the grand finale to a perfect day when everyone had difficulties suppressing a smile. Another thing you notice about Fergie on her wedding day is that she just seems to be having so much fun. Once the couple emerged, complete with their teddy bear, confetti filled the air. It seemed to get everywhere. There's almost this sense of, can you really believe I'm here? Am I actually a fairy tale bride? Whereas, you know, you don't always see that in other royal weddings. The queen was there to see them off as the royal couple took to the air by helicopter from the Royal Chelsea Hospital for the short flight down the Thames to Heathrow Airport. One of the things that you start to notice with royal weddings is that oftentimes these couples come out of this magnificent, unimaginably fantastic day. And then the reality starts to set in and it's not quite the fantasy that was portrayed on that wedding day. They're off to the Azores on honeymoon for a bit of peace and quiet. Things were really happy for Fergie and Andrew at the beginning of their marriage. Um, they quickly had two daughters, Princess Beatrice, and then two years later, Princess Eugenie. Um, and they were really this happy family, but eventually by the early 90s, tensions had sort of started and there were rumors swirling that the couple wasn't as happy as they had once been and that they were growing apart. Fergie and Andrew announced their separation in 1992, just six years after the wedding. By 1996, their divorce was final. As the years wore on, things started to thaw, and Fergie has really been welcomed back into the royal fold for the most part, certainly by her ex-husband, Prince Andrew. The two even lived together at Royal Lodge on the grounds of Windsor Castle, so they often call themselves the world's friendliest exes. Fergie and Andrew didn't have the happily ever after that everybody fantasized about, but they do have a fantastic relationship. They co-parented their children very well and um, have a great relationship and communicate about all the issues that arise. Everyone agreed it had been a right royal occasion. It is the sight, after all these months of build-up and speculation, that many have been longing for. Kate looked absolutely stunning on the day. Um, her dress was universally um, adored. And a lovely moment because the Queen has allowed the royal couple some time on their own for the crowd to take that first glimpse in as they emerged onto the balcony. When Prince William, Duke of Cambridge, and the commoner Catherine Middleton were married in 2011, it was the most celebrated royal wedding in 30 years. Kate and William's wedding was the first royal wedding since Charles and Diana's in 1981, where we were seeing the direct heir to the throne get married. So it truly was a historic day. Kate was the 29-year-old daughter of successful entrepreneurs. William was the 28-year-old grandson of the Queen and second in line to the throne. People have such a special place in their heart for him because he had such a tragic event happen with losing his mother when he was a teenager. Um, and everybody, I feel like, just wants him to be happy and it didn't take him long for him to fall in love and find his life partner. Uh, when he went to college at the University of St. Andrews in St. Andrews, Scotland, he met Kate Middleton in his freshman year dorms. They became friends. Eventually, with friends, they moved in together into an apartment and it was there that sort of romance started to blossom. Often she's referred to as a commoner, and it's true. She's not from, from an aristocratic family, but she didn't grow up in a traditional sort of middle-class family either. Her parents really did um, have a lucrative business. They started a company called Party Pieces, which was a mail order and now online um, party supply company. Um, and they really built, built this empire from the ground up. 
they were very wealthy. This isn't a case of um, somebody who was having a rags to riches transformation. Um, Kate had a very comfortable upbringing. William and Kate were engaged in October 2010 in a place that is really special to William and that's Kenya. And William proposed there, they kept it a secret for a little while, then returned home and announced it the following month. And Kate showed off her new sapphire and diamond engagement ring, which was not new, it had belonged to Diana, William's mother. It was hugely meaningful for William to have you know, a piece of his mother who obviously never got to meet Kate and to attend his wedding and be a part of that experience with him, but you know, he said it was a, his way of kind of keeping her close and keeping her in mind throughout this whole process. William and Kate were married on April 29th, 2011. The historic event was broadcast live in 180 countries and an estimated 2 billion people tuned in. So if you imagined a fairy tale princess and her dress, is that the picture you had in your mind? I think perhaps it might have been. Kate's dress was absolutely beautiful and there was tons of speculation about which designer she'd choose, what it would look like, um, you know, what fabrics, what kind of inspiration she'd take, and it pretty much was everything we could have hoped for and more. It is the site, after all these months of build-up and speculation, that many have been longing for. And she's taking a moment to give the crowd a wave. It was a gorgeous gown. It was designed by Sarah Burton for Alexander McQueen. It had a lace, long sleeve, so a little more modest. It had a beautiful, big skirt, a long train with lots of detail sewn onto it. And then there was a V-neck on the dress. Kate looked absolutely stunning on the day. Um, her dress was universally um, adored. You always need something borrowed on your wedding day. And Kate had a great one. The Queen actually lent Kate her tiara, and it had a thousand diamonds on it. The Queen herself told William, this day is about you and Catherine. Make the guest list how you want to make it. So I thought that was a really sweet thing. You can see the Queen's evolution from kind of reluctant, standoffish mom to really warm, supportive granny. So Tiny William did just that on his wedding day. They had the 1,900 ages. guests, not exactly a small affair, but it was pared down significantly thanks At to Queen time, Elizabeth's it was advice. Of, um, of, of course, it wouldn't be a royal wedding without Sir Egypt. Elton John, who is in the audience. Adult. Victoria and actors. David Beckham were there. It really was a, a party atmosphere. Of course, one of the so big standouts of the day were Princess Beatrice and Princess Eugenie, William's first cousins, who wore those elaborate, memorable fascinators atop their heads. And they really became a meme before anyone even knew what a meme was. But it was Kate's maid of honor, Pippa Middleton, who really kind of stole the show. Pippa Middleton in a beautifully sleek, elegant dress. Nobody knew who Pippa was before this, but she wore this really beautiful white dress and it really hugged her backside. Cameras got hold of the backside of a stunning maid of honor carrying a future queen's train. The question on just about everyone's mind at that moment, who's that girl? She really had this world stage to showcase her incredible body and she embraced it. And in fact, I think she was the sexiest bridesmaid ever. I'm stepping into the spring sunshine the new royal couple, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. It was really sweet to see Prince William, this, this person who everyone wanted to be happy after, you know, the death of his mother, seem so happy and seem so in love and, you know, something that was clearly a love match and a really strong partnership. They look really quite relaxed and very happy, waving to the crowd. At this point, they had been together for almost eight years. Um, and, you know, you don't get to eight years without of dating without being really in love and really knowing the other person. And everyone was really excited to see that. We can see some movement now be behind those curtains. And here we go. Oh, wow, she says. Oh, oh wow. wow. <laughs> there was a lot of love for them as a couple. Kate felt like just the right match. She's never set a foot wrong. She felt very steady, she felt very committed to him, and it was something that gave Royals fans a lot of hope that this marriage was totally the real deal. A convertible Aston Martin emerging from the gates of Buckingham Palace. They drove off in an Aston Martin from Buckingham Palace. The license plate said, just married, and it was so cute, and really like 
such a surprise for the crowd that they were, you know, driving off like any normal married couple, Prince William in the driver's seat. What a view the crowds are being rewarded with. It looks as though Prince Harry may have been at work on this vehicle. Prince William and Princess Kate have really had such a happy and wonderful marriage so far. Um, you know, they had a few years to themselves before they started their family, but they welcomed Prince George, their first child, in July 2013. Over the next five years, William and Kate had two more children, Princess Charlotte and Prince Louis. Kate has really blossomed in the role of princess. She seems to do it all effortlessly. She looks great. She relates to people so naturally. She's the perfect princess. What a, what a thing for, for, for Kate Middleton to end up on the balcony of Buckingham Palace. Who would have thought? I mean, that really is the most extraordinary fairy tale. She comes. Here comes the bride. All right. This is the first time we got to see Meghan as a princess. And she really did look the part. She looked every bit the princess bride, incredibly regal and ready for this moment. This is when you finally get to see that dress. Incredible body, and she embraced it. And in fact, I think she was the sexiest bridesmaid ever. I'm stepping into the spring sunshine, the new royal couple, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. It was really sweet to see You're Prince William, to be this person who everyone wanted to be happy after, you know, the death of his mother, seemed so happy and seemed so in love, and you know, something that was clearly a love match and a really strong partnership. They look really quite relaxed and very happy, waving to the crowd. At this point, they had been together for almost eight years. Um, and, you know, you don't get to eight years without of dating, without being really in love and really knowing the other person. And everyone was really excited to see that. You can see some movement now behind those curtains. And here we go. Oh, wow, she says. Oh, wow. There was a lot of love for them as a couple. Kate felt like just the right match. Set a foot wrong. She felt very steady. She felt very committed to him. And it was something that gave Royals fans a lot of hope that this marriage was totally the real deal. A convertible Aston Martin emerging from the gates of Buckingham Palace. They drove off in an Aston Martin from Buckingham Palace. The license plate said just married. And it was so cute and really like such a surprise for the crowd that they were, you know, driving off like any normal married couple, Prince William in the driver's seat. What a view the crowds are being rewarded with. It looks as though Prince Harry may have been at work on this vehicle. <laughs> Prince William and Princess Kate have really had such a happy and wonderful marriage so far. Um, you know, they had a few years to themselves before they started their family, but they welcomed Prince George, their first child, in July 2013. Over the next five years, William and Kate had two more children, Princess Charlotte and Prince Louis. Kate has really blossomed in the role of princess. She seems to do it all effortlessly. She looks great. She relates to people so naturally. She's the perfect princess. What a, what a thing for, for, for Kate Middleton to end up on the balcony of B Buckingham Palace. Who would have thought? I mean, that really is the most extraordinary fairy tale. Here comes the bride. This is the first time we got to see Meghan as a princess. And she really did look the part. She looked every bit the princess bride, incredibly regal and ready for this moment. This is when you finally get to see that dress. couple, a new chapter, and after the intimacy of the marriage vows, a place on the world stage. Prince Harry, the Duke of Sussex, and the American actress Rachel Meghan Markle were married in 2018. Seven years had passed since the wedding of William and Kate, and nearly two billion tuned in to see Princess Diana's second son marry the woman he loved. Meghan and Harry's wedding was like nothing we have ever seen before, and that has a lot to do with Meghan herself. This is the first time we are seeing a biracial royal bride. 
an American royal bride, um, a woman who has been divorced. So this was something new we were seeing and it really blew all the other royal weddings out of the water in terms of news value. Meghan was the 36-year-old star of the hit legal drama, Suits. Harry was the 34-year-old grandson of the Queen and sixth in line to the throne. We've been watching Harry grow up since he was born. Of course, Princess Diana and Prince Charles followed the tradition of bringing out their newborn son onto the steps of the Linda Wing at St. Mary's Hospital in London, where the world got its first look at the little ginger prince um, with his red hair. The guy was christened in this. Mm. Looks remarkably well, despite it. Harry is so beloved across the world, but especially in the UK. I mean, the citizens have just had such a special place in their hearts for him since he lost his mother at a young age. The readers have always been very affectionate towards Harry because they saw him grow up. And they've gone from him seeing him as this little boy who'd lost his mother to now finally fully in love and happy. The fact that I fell in love with Meghan so incredibly quickly was a, was a sort of confirmation to me that that everything, everything, all the stars were aligned, everything was just perfect. It was this beautiful woman just sort of literally tripped and fell into my life, I <laughs> fell into her life. Meghan and Harry actually met on a blind date and they hit it off right away. I was beautifully surprised when I, when I walked into that room and saw her and there she was sitting there. I was like, okay, well, I really have to up, up, up my game. <laughs> the world found out about Harry and Meghan when one of the London tabloids confirmed the relationship in October 2016. But Harry and Meghan had actually been dating for a few months by then, and they were building a relationship. Harry and Meghan's engagement was announced on November 27, 2017. That same day, the happy couple sat for an interview with the BBC. It happened uh, a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. um, early this month, here at, at our cottage. Um, it's a standard, typical night it's for us. It's a cosy us. night. It was what we're doing, just roasting chicken roasting and having... Roasting chicken, <laughs> trying to roast a chicken. Trying to roast a chicken. And it just, uh, just an amazing surprise. It was so sweet and, and natural and very romantic. He got on one knee. Of course. Was it an instant yes from you? Yes. As a matter of fact, I could barely let you finish proposing. I was no. like, can I say yes now? She didn't even let me finish. <laughs> Welcome to the royal town of Windsor, where the stage is set for the wedding of the year. On May 19th, 2018, Harry and Meghan were married inside St George's Chapel at Windsor Castle, roughly 20 miles west of London. 600 lucky guests were in attendance, while nearly 30 million were watching it in the US alone. The interest surrounding Meghan and Harry's wedding was massive. In fact, in the US, six million more people tuned in to Meghan and Harry's wedding than they did to William and Kate's. And I think one of the key reasons for that is that we had an American royal bride. Harry and Meghan's wedding was like a red carpet. There were so many celebrities there, and not just small celebrities, we're talking big celebrities. We're talking George Clooney and Amal, we're talking Priyanka Chopra, we're talking Oprah. It was star studded I'm sure everyone who walks through these palace gates must feel like the luckiest person on earth to get to have these this opportunity. As we were watching the guests start to walk up toward Windsor Castle and towards St. George's Chapel, I think that one of the things we were most excited to see was the brothers. Royal watchers were very excited when uh, Prince Harry walked down the aisle with his brother, Prince William, on the day of the wedding. The chemistry between them, the camaraderie, was just very sweet. And obviously we'd seen this happen in reverse when Harry was the best man for William. We're looking now at the car that has the woman of the moment, Ms. Meghan Markle. What a moment of history for her. Meghan arrived um, at the wedding, at the ceremony, in a cart that had, had been loaned by the Queen. And this was everything Americans had fantasized about. This was Disney come to life. When the car pulled up, um, she steps outside and you get that first glimpse of that gorgeous gown. Here comes the bride. All right. This is the first time we got to see Meghan as a princess. And she really did look the part. She looked every bit the princess bride, incredibly regal and ready for this moment. This is when you finally get to see that dress. All eyes were on her dress. And 
It was very chic. It was surprising. People were expecting a big princess moment, a huge glamorous gown, but it was a little bit more understated. The dress itself, at first, there was some sort of like, oh, so she went simple. It was simple. And I think what we've seen in the years since, um, since the wedding has been an appreciation for the fact that she chose something more modern um, from, of course, a female designer, Claire Waite Keller at Givenchy. It featured a, a really classic line um, silk and silk organza underskirt. Um, there was a stunning veil um, that featured embroidered flowers from across the Commonwealth. She had a really long, elegant train. This dress was really understated in many ways. Um, no, no embroidery whatsoever, beading, glitz, sparkle, none of that. Um, she had sparkle in her jewels and her tiara, of course. Um, she really let the veil take the spotlight for certainly, um, you know, that dramatic walk up the steps and then back back down, down the aisle as well. The veil itself was so um, sweeping that it really um, sort of, I think, was the eye-popping um, part of that look. For me, I thought it was the perfect choice. I thought this was the ultimate dress to introduce her to the British citizens who are already really value um, understatement. And so I thought it was respectful, I thought it was beautiful, and just the perfect dress for her to marry Harry in. A particularly touching moment was when Prince Charles walked Meghan down the aisle. I don't think Prince Charles probably imagined that he would ever be walking someone down the aisle as he's a father of sons, but it was particularly a motive that she asked him if she he would stand in her in her father's place and walk him down the aisle. One of the highlights of the wedding, and certainly one of the most spontaneous moments, was when Prince Harry got his first up-close look at Meghan, and we could all see him mouthing the words, wow, you look amazing. And it was such a romantic, um, breathtaking moment. Um, certainly that's something that, um, you, you know, grooms um, throughout time and, and around the world have that kind of, you know, there she is moment, and we all got to see that play out, and um, it was really beautiful to watch. Bishop Michael Curry brought some Chicago flavor to the royal wedding. The wedding was a beautiful combination of American culture and British culture. Imagine this tired old world when love is, is the way. There was the traditional chapel, but then you had an American preacher with the energy and excitement, and some people, in the congregation did seem a little bit surprised it wasn't what they were used to. You just tell the love of Jesus how he died to save us all. Oh, that's the palm in Gilead. The reaction to Bishop Michael Curry was all over the faces of everyone in the audience. You could definitely see a lot of uh, inquisitive looks on the faces of a lot of the royal family members. Just kind of not sure what they were watching. And what we saw was a lot of kind of um, Surprise, a little dismay, a little maybe even discomfort among the royals. I don't know that that was necessarily because they didn't approve. I, I don't think it was that. I think it was that this was something they have never heard in an Anglican church like this before. And it just really caught them by surprise and was out of their usual comfort zone. We must discover love the redemptive power of love. On so many levels, um, that really en encapsulated why this wedding was so different from any royal wedding that had ever come before. And it was really such a refreshing and also truly reflective part of Meghan's heritage being brought to life very, very um, animatedly by um, Bishop Curry. <laughs> Of course, at every wedding, everybody's waiting for the first kiss. And at a royal wedding, it's even more hyped. It did not disappoint because although there wasn't a balcony, there was still that, that you know, beautiful, dramatic moment when they come out as husband and wife. And there is the kiss that everyone was hoping for and waiting for. After they tied the knot, Meghan and Harry went on their epic carriage ride through the streets of Windsor. Salutes everywhere and the royal family and everyone else waves on. And this was really a time for them to celebrate with the rest of the public. There were tons of signs and well-wishers, and you could just see Meghan and Harry laughing and smiling throughout this 
this 20 minute carriage ride. After the ceremony, the couple attended a luncheon at Windsor Castle before heading off to a reception at nearby Frogmore House, hosted by Prince Charles. We saw Harry come out in this classic black tux and then Meghan gave everyone the Hollywood moment they were waiting for when she stepped out in her Stella McCartney halter, halter gown. And then the Hollywood moment just continued when they stepped into this beautiful Jaguar and it was just this really cool moment seeing them drive off together as husband and wife on their way to celebrate. We've got some breaking news from Great Britain this morning. The worldwide wait is over. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle welcoming their firstborn child this morning, and it's a boy. In May 2019, nearly one year after their wedding, Harry and Meghan welcomed their first son, Archie Harrison Mountbatten Windsor. It's just been the dream, so it's been a special couple days. We can expect big things from this couple in the future. We know that they would like to build this family. Um, they're starting obviously with their first baby, but I don't think that um, anyone imagines that they'll stop there. Um, but further than that, we also know that Megan has big plans of her own in terms of philanthropy, in terms of giving back um, to her new country. Megan and Harry have totally embraced their roles as the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, and they've been welcomed into the royal family as a couple with open arms, and now they're just really hitting the ground running um, in, in terms of their royal duties. We're a fantastic team, we know we are, and and we'll, we, we hope to, you know, over time, try and have as much impact for all the things that we care about as, as much as possible. In 2018, just five months after the wedding of Harry and Meghan, St George's Chapel played host to yet another round of royal nuptials, when Princess Eugenie of York married the commoner Jack Brooksbank. This was a huge royal wedding because, let's face it, there aren't that many people who call the Queen Granny, and Princess Eugenie is one of them. It marked the first wedding for Fergie and Andrew's daughters, and so it's just a really great time for the country to come together and celebrate a wonderful occasion. Eugenie was the 28-year-old granddaughter of the Queen and ninth from her grandmother. Okay, that is uh, the Queen's personal tiara um, that she has had something borrowed. Clearly, it was given with love by Granny the Queen to her granddaughter. Um, and the two of them share a very, very close bond. And I think that you saw um, the love between them that day, and then you saw the sparkle on Eugenie's head, which reflected that as well. It was a time where everyone got to see her fully coming into her own. She was beautiful, just so, so serene and regal on her wedding day. After they tied the knot, they celebrated with friends and family at a reception hosted by the Queen in Windsor Castle. Eugenie and Jack drove to their reception in Aston Martin, uh, one of the rare models that was actually used in the James Bond films. And then hours later, they went on to the Royal Lodge, which is uh, Prince Andrew's royal residence, where they had a more intimate evening celebration. Since the wedding, the lives of Princess Eugenie and Jack have kind of gotten back to normal. I mean, he's a busy businessman, and she's an art director. We kind of expect that they'll have children pretty soon. Um, they've been together a long time, and they both love kids and want to have a family. Any royal wedding is a time to celebrate, to see the royal family come together, to see the queen out, um, and this was did not disappoint. It was full of a lot of special moments, a lot of pomp and circumstance, and Eugenie looked stunning. 